Hello everyone and welcome to the 3D Experience Podcast. We will discuss everything from business to the latest technology as it relates to the process of design and manufacturing. Your hosts for this journey are John Milbury, Technical Director for Dassault Systems SolidWorks, and me, Mike Bookley, Senior Product Manager at Dassault Systems SolidWorks. Okay, so today we have uh, a pretty cool guy with us. Uh, his name is Glenn Coleman. He's uh, the mastermind behind uh, Volumel, as you may know it, and SolidWorks Cam Pro and other products. So uh, Glenn, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you became such a genius. <laughs> well, that's debatable, I guess, but um, I uh, have been involved in manufacturing for, oh gosh, going on 40 years now. Um, Started in a machine shop in 1980. Uh, was fortunate enough to be put in the tool and die room, where I got some excellent training. Uh, and I was turning crank handles um, on Bridgeport style mills and engine lays. And um, then that graduated to uh, you know running the CNC machines and setting them up, etc. And I only did that for a, two or three years in, in a couple of different shops. And then I uh, became an NC programmer. And um, that I enjoyed thoroughly. Uh, I was good at it, and um, I, I just thought it was fascinating. And then I progressed from there to applications engineering positions at a couple of different uh, CAD CAM software vendors, uh, the actual developers of CAD CAM software. First one was Gerber Systems Technology, and then after that was uh, MCS, Manufacturing and Consulting Services, the make, makers of uh, Anvil 4000, Anvil 5000. Um, worked there for a while, worked at PTC, um, where I uh, came up with a product called Expert Machinist. And um, then in the, in the year 2000, went to work at a small company called Surfware. And I, that's kind of where this story really begins. But it's just been hands-on uh, machining and programming, you know, making my living by cutting chips. Uh, so it's uh, it's more practice than theory for me. What did Yogi Berra say? In, in theory, theory is the same as practice, and in practice it ain't. Um, you know, I know what it's like to get the hot chips down your shirt. I know what it feels like when something's cutting well versus when it's not cutting well, uh, what it sounds like, what it smells like. Uh, and that experience uh, early on was uh, invaluable in enabling me to do what I do today, which is uh, design uh, CAM software to try to improve the machining process. Uh, so Glenn, um, would you say that you had maybe 15 or 20 years of experience before you uh, entered sur surfware? Uh, I would say I had exactly 20 years of experience now that I think about it. Yeah, 1980 to 2000. Yes. Okay. So the table was really set um, with your background, your experience. Everything was just kind of set and you were at uh, sur Surfware. And uh, <clears throat> I guess that's when, uh, I guess that's when the, the magic started, right? Well, that's kind of when this started. Um, for me personally, then also, I think, as as we'll talk about moving forward here, just the uh, the state of the art is where we are now with uh, the type of milling that we're doing, which has changed dramatically in, in the last uh, decade, really. So Yeah, it sure has. Mm. Yeah. So I got a question for you. <laughs> you you've, uh, you've been around through this evolution, you know, and, and today, you know, everybody seems to have what they call high-speed machining. I mean, heck, even some companies try to call themselves that as a naming convention. You know, it, it, as as this technology has evolved, you know, and uh, everybody now claims to have, you know, the best thing since sliced bread, how, how, do, how do you guys navigate that, you know, from a, a development standpoint? Because it seems like every day somebody creates some new marketing about how they're better than everybody else. Sure, and, and marketing is a huge part of this industry, as you're well aware. <laughs> um, but you know, the term high-speed milling, if we look at that, um, is it's been around at least since the '80s, and in according to my observations, it, it seems to be uh, just seems to have come about as milling machines started getting faster and faster uh, spindles on them, and uh, so you could uh, 
uh, spin the tool faster. And so the high speed milling in its early days was really uh, driving the machine faster through spindle speed and increasing the feed rates. But in order to do that, they had to back off on either the axial or the radial depth of cut, and most often both, in order for the tool to survive because it was still getting jammed in the corners or the tool paths were no different. Mm -hmm. So the machines were moving faster, certainly, but if you had to go, you know, an inch deep, instead of going one inch deep with one cut going slow, you'd go, you know, 10 or 20 cuts really fast. Um, would, was the machine moving faster? Certainly. Were the parts being produced any faster? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't see any real evidence that they were. But that was kind of the, the earliest beginning of this. And, and um, but that was just, I think the name was appropriate, high speed milling. The machine's moving at a higher speed. Uh, are the parts being made faster? I don't think so. Um, so what we have come to today is uh, what I'm hearing more often is the term high efficiency milling, which is I think much more accurate as, uh, as a description of, of what we have uh, before us now. And, um, and that's one of the things that we could talk about here is, is this, with the origins of these high efficiency milling tool paths, how they came to be. And there are a couple of different technologies that have kind of um, uh, percolated to the top, I guess. And so we could talk about the, uh, the differences between them because there are some scientific differences, some algorithmic differences and in, in where they uh, apply. But um, yeah, yeah I think so that's high fast. speed machine is, I think in my mind, very different from high efficiency milling. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, in my opinion, from what I've seen, you know, it, it's more marketing buzz than anything. It's, it's like that, you know, when people talk about the feature manager, you know, that's sort of a, a thing that's taken for granted in, in the software industry today, you know, across all things. But 20 years ago, it wasn't, right? Everybody refers to that kind of stuff today. And I, I think HSM, in my opinion, sort of fell into, oh, well, just, it, you know, it's that warm, fuzzy feeling of three letters put together that means something and it, it just gets lumped in. Um, you know, I, I, you know, as you talk about science-based tool paths versus out algorithms, you know, it, it's one of those things that's an evolution too, but it's amazing how many people that I've talked to that don't understand the difference between the two components. So if, yeah, if, if you could give us a little bit of an understanding of that, you know, you could probably explain it better than I can. Um, but what is it that makes Sellative and Volume Mill unique compared to, you know, a bunch of the other mid-market people out there that try to do something from some other piece? Right. So uh, this gets back to the, the origins of this, which is uh, really traced back to the early 2000s. But the purpose, the, you know, the reason these things came about is there's been this, what I call the universal milling problem that's always existed, especially with these parallel offset tool paths where you just take the boundary of the geometry, offset it until it gets to the middle, trim them up and follow it back out the other way. That's your tool path. And this is what keeps happening. If you see on the screen, the, um, uh, the tool gets buried. So that's sure. the problem. So, and the problem is tool overload. That cut width is 100% is of, of the tool, which is never a good thing. And how do you get there? Well, if we back this up a little bit, this particular tool path has made two cuts and it's stepped over to begin the third cut. But even this is a bad thing. At the end of the second cut, the machine has had to come to a complete stop uh, material removal rate was zero and then it made a sharp right hand turn and in the distance equal to the step over the machine was asked to accelerate from zero up to the program feed rate and then decelerate back down to zero all mm -hmm. while overloading the, the leading edge of that cutter yeah so you come to a, a abrupt stop you turn left and uh, begin the next cut now here it's, it's kind of okay because the cuts are parallel and your cut width is going to be constant from here, but only until you get to here. Yep. Now where this is, of course, is where the leading edge of this tool has reached a point that is normal to where the center of the tool turned on the previous cut. As right. you continue past this, of course, the cut width starts increasing. 
And the farther you go, the more acute the angle, the worse this gets. Look at that. It, you basically slot milled right there. That's exactly slot milling. That's exactly what it is. So this is the, the problem that um, needed to be solved because over the years, machine tools and cutting tools became so much more sophisticated, uh, so much more capable. Uh, they could run at outrageous speeds. But a toolpath like this is going to limit how fast you can go because you have to set your feeds and speeds so you survive this full width slotting cut. What that Which, means is that yeah. when you're cutting from here, down. I'm sorry? It slows everything down, doesn't it? Yeah, because where you're cutting from here to here where you have a constant cut width, you're going way too slow. Correct. Uh, I mean, and so it's this crazy, crazy pendulum swing. You're either completely abusing these tools in the, by tools, machine tool and cutting tools, by driving them into the corner, completely overloading them, or they're being completely underutilized. And yeah. they virtually never get to operate in the sweet zone. It's either too slow or, you know, uh, being pushed, punished really, <laughs> up to the point of failure almost in these, in these worst case conditions. So this is the problem that needed to be solved. And as computing power evolved, um, you know, machine tools since the early days have been capable of linear interpol and circular interpolation. So you could make all the actual motion that you see today in high efficiency milling toolpaths, but they couldn't do it fast enough. There, there was no way for them to respond. So it was kind of a um, perfect storm, if you will, of, of uh, progress in the machine tool industry, the cutting tool industry, and the computing power that was available on everybody's desktop. So this now opened up possibilities to change the toolpath. Change the toolpath from being the weakest link in the chain, which is what it has always been and always is if you have a parallel offset toolpath such as this, and make it so it's no longer the weakest link of the chain. There will always be a weakest link, but why not let that be you know, the cutting tool's ability to clear a chip? Why not let it be the spindle speed limitation on the machine tool? or how fast it can feed. Why does a tool path have to be the, the limiting factor? I always say that um, your machine tools, from the biggest, most expensive one you could think of to the tiniest little desktop office mill, they really only do one thing. They do what a tool path tells it to do. Um, that's all they do. And now the better machines execute the commands better and more efficiently and faster, but if you give it a bad command, it's just gonna execute a bad command uh, faster and more efficiently. So the toolpath technology had not kept up with advances in the hardware end, and that's what uh, began to change in the early 2000s. Yeah. So a brief history on this. Uh, as I mentioned, I started uh, Surfware in August of 2000, so quite a while ago. And uh, while I was there, uh, I invented a uh, really was just an algorithm at the time that would control the angle of engagement between the tool and the material so that that tool never got jammed in those corners. So it, uh, uh, you could always have a, a more even load on the cutting tool. And what was kind of, not funny, but um, interesting is I didn't start out to do that. <laughs> The way this started was the owner of the company, Alan Deal, uh, challenged me with coming up with a way to drive a tool so that you can have a step over greater than 50% of the cutter without leaving little posts of uncut material standing up in the corners. Um, and So you're trying to solve the wedge machining problem? Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> and interestingly, there was a, a gentleman there uh, who was uh, a retired math teacher and uh, he would come in and talk to me a lot. He just worked part-time in the document documentation department. But um, he pointed out to me one day that the uh, angle of engagement is greater if you're cutting a counterclockwise arc, assuming climb milling, than it is if you're cutting straight. Because the obvious way to eliminate sharp corners is to put circles in the toolpath. But when he pointed out the, that the engagement angle was greater while cutting a circle than it was cutting a straight line, I, it shocked me. It was a real facepalm moment for me. I mean, shame on me. I should have made that observation on my own, but I didn't. He did, and I thought, well, wait a minute. Maybe that's the answer. So 
I started investigating this and I saw back as gosh, early as 1989, um, uh, some uh, university professor had made that observation and many others had. And then it turned out that there were lots of uh, uh, doctoral dissertations and, and uh, even patent applications of people trying to make a tool path that would keep the engagement of the tool constant throughout. Uh, they all failed. Um, and I think the reason they failed is most uh, PhD level uh, intellects probably never worked in a machine shop for $4.25 an hour like I did. Um, and I think they were trying to come up with a theoretically pure solution and really trying to keep the engagement of the tool and the material, that angle of engagement, constant always. Well, with the cylindrically shaped cutter and the completely uh, unlimited shape of the material you're trying to remove, that's just physically not possible. So after uh, the gentleman at uh, Surfware made the observation to me about this engagement angle, that it's like a light bulb went on. And I thought, well, instead of making tool paths that just round the corners, because others have done that, but that does little to no good uh, for, for lots of reasons. I thought, well, why not make tool paths that are based almost entirely on circles, especially concentric circles. Um, but if you have a set of concentric circles, the angle of engagement is greater when the circle radius is smaller. The larger the radius, the smaller the engagement angle increase as a opposed to a straight line. So I came up with this concept of making a whole bunch of sets of concentric circles, not equally spaced, so that within any one of those sets, no matter where you are, the angle of engagement will be the same. And then if you, in the areas between those sets of circles, the tool had to get from one to the other, well, you were always guaranteed that the engagement angle would be less than your limit. It would never be at your limit, but it would be less than. An underloaded tool is better than an overloaded tool. So um, I started drawing up these things, just making lines and arcs and splines on, on uh, using SurfCam. And uh, we actually made some tool paths by having a tool follow this geometry. And we put it on a machine and it worked. Um, now, that was great and it was exciting, but it really wasn't going anywhere. Um, it got to where for any part geometry, I could pretty much draw what the tool path should do, but the development staff there was not able to turn it into a product. Uh, it turns out mathematically it was fairly complex. And then one day, just serendipitously, uh, Surfware hired a, a new developer, Dr. Evan Sherbrook. And he didn't know anything about machining. He didn't know what a machine tool was. Um, but when I described to him what I was trying to do, he said, oh yeah, I can do that. And six months later, we were uh, running what a product that came to be known as TrueMill uh, on a Haas machine, a VF2SS, I believe it was, in the SurfCam booth at West Tech in Los Angeles. Um, so the problem could be solved mathematically. It just took someone with the, uh, the chops to do it. As I said, uh, Dr. Sherbrooke doesn't, uh, know anything or didn't know anything about machining at the time, but uh, what he had that I didn't, and most of us don't, is uh, four different degrees from MIT. So uh, obviously including the PhD. So he was able to take this idea and what in the industry is called reducing it to practice, making something that was not just a, a mock-up that I could do one-offs on, but um, something that could be applied in the general case. And, uh, and that's what TrueMill was. It was uh, released in 2005. It was the first tool path to effectively control the angle of engagement between the tool and the material. Again, because I looked at it from the standpoint of we didn't need a scientifically elegant or pure solution. We needed a practical solution. It was like kind of like, uh, I think it was Igor Sikorsky back when they first made helicopters. They overcame the power to, to weight ratio issue and got the thing up in the air, but as soon as they did, the whole fuselage of the helicopter started spinning in the opposite direction of the rotor. Um, and people tried all kinds of things to combat that, double rotors spinning in opposite directions, all, all these sorts of things. And then uh, Mr. Sikorsky said, well, wait a minute, what we need here is a practical solution, not a scientifically pure solution. And so he stuck a 
small rotor on the tail, blow it in the opposite direction of the way the thing wanted to spin and solve the problem. And that's still in place today. So I think that's why uh, we were able to make this toolpath that did these things that people had been trying to do, but actually worked in a practical manner. Um, the uh, true mill is wonderful technology. It's of course near and dear to my heart. Uh, unfortunately, it only ran inside of SurfCam. So if you didn't have SurfCam, you couldn't use it. And SurfCam had a uh, Surfware with SurfCam had a very very small market penetration. Uh, if you look at you know the number of cam seats throughout the world, um, the SurfCam assets of Surfware have since been sold. And um, I'm not sure TrueMill even really exists except in uh, very old copies of SurfCam that were out there uh, because TrueMill was not sold along with the, uh, the rest of the SurfCam assets. So a bit of a long story, but that's, that's where, how that came about. What is also interesting is at the same time, at or about the same time, in the UK, there are a couple of guys in an outfit called FreeSteel. And they were working to solve the same exact problem, overloading the cutter going into those sharp corners. They came up with their own solution. It was very different from TrueMill. Uh, so opposite sides of the Atlantic, you know, two different groups came up with two different uh, solutions to the same problem. Their product they called adaptive clearing. Um, and the way it works is by uh, avoiding overloading the cutter by just cutting right along whatever the uh, current material boundary is. Just cuts right along it in a manner that doesn't let the tool get over engaged. And it does this no matter what the shape of the part is. Now, when they first did this, I, I think they did it maybe for Simco, uh, which was not a CAD CAM system really, but more a toolkit that other CAD CAM companies would use. Um, so I think it was a little slow on the uptake, but it did really go at one point. Um, so this technology has been widely either licensed, sold, uh, and this is, I know just from what I read on the FreeSteel website, it's still there. Um, if you go there, you'll read about Julian blogging about uh, mostly hang gliding and uh, kayak diving and things like this, but they do have an interesting archive section where you can go back and, and learn about adaptive clearing. But uh, at some point, and I don't know how, uh, HSM Works uh, ended up with this, whether they bought the software or bought a you know object code or a snapshot of the source code, whether they licensed it, or whether they copied it, I don't know. But they ended up with it. And um, at one point, I think uh, Julian and Martin even made this available as open source so anyone could get it. I mean, ModuleWorks has, a, has it now in some form or another. Again, how they got it, I don't know, um, but uh, they do have it, and since module works is virtually everywhere, now this adaptive clearing is virtually everywhere. It has different names. Some call it adaptive machining, some call it adaptive roughing. I mean, the stuff that Mastercam has uh, dynamic milling. Uh, if you look at a dynamic milling toolpath and compare it to a very early adaptive clearing toolpath, I think you'd probably be hard pressed to, to notice any differences. Again, I don't know if, if CNC software purchased or licensed the code or if they just made their own version. Um, none of that really matters. The fact is uh, they, they have it. One thing that is interesting, and, and it's clear if you go to the, the FreeSteel website, is uh, Julian and, and Martin are, haven't been involved with this for a long, long time. At least I see no evidence of them being involved anymore. So, uh, and that's very different from, from what you'll, you'll learn about us. But, uh, so anybody that's got anything called adaptive or really dynamic, um, it's clear where the, where the code originated, not necessarily the actual code, but where the, uh, the concept that they're using originated. How it got to be in their possession is uh, probably a little less clear, but, but there you have it. So in 2007, uh, Dr. Sherbrooke and I left uh, Surfware, uh, we don't need to go into the reasons why. And we founded Celerative Technologies. And at Celerative, when we started Celerative, we came up with a toolpath technology that did not control the engagement angle between the tool and the material. Um, 
couple of reasons. <laughs> the biggest one is Surfware uh, owns that technology, or Surfware at the time owned that technology. Um, they had patented that, that technology. My name was at the top of the patent, but I didn't own it. So we couldn't do anything with engagement control. Um, in addition, engagement control uh, has a couple of drawbacks. Uh, don't get me wrong, it, it, it's wonderful in what it does. But as an arc gets smaller, as I mentioned, it's like you're going into a corner. The smaller the toolpath arc is, the radius of the toolpath arc is a G3 move, the greater the increase in engagement angle gets. And as the toolpath radius starts approaching the radius of the cutter, you get to where you can't progress hardly at all, maybe you know tenths of an inch, and of course, I mean tenths of a thousandth of an inch, uh, before your engagement angle is is achieved or even exceeded. It's kind of like if you uh, you have you're on a golf green and you put the ball halfway to the hole, and then you put it halfway to the hole again. You keep doing that, and theoretically, you'll never get to the hole because you keep going halfway. That's what happens. So sooner or later, you have to exceed your target engagement angle. But it adds a significant amount of toolpath length. So we wanted to avoid these things. So we uh, took a different look at it. And, and the, the point of view we took is, wait a minute, let's, let's stop you know, thinking in terms of removing stock. And let's start thinking in terms of, of making chips. And what's the best way to make chips that are uh, the most uniform in size, shape, and formation? And that's what Volumil does. Um, it's called Volumil because we manage the rate of material removal through uh, controlling the formation of each chip. And further, by normalizing the amount of work from the, you know, the physics principle of work that's required to form each chip. And in doing so, you could optimize heat evacuation. And what we came up with doesn't do uh, uh, engagement control like TrueMill does. It doesn't uh, nibble along the edge of the stock model like Adaptive does. It uh, looks at the entire volume that's to be removed with the present toolpath and plans a path through that material where we can keep the cut width constant and keep the chip formation as uniform as possible. And it just turns out that in the general case, uh, volume mill outperforms all other high efficiency milling technology with the evidence I've seen. Now, don't get me wrong. There are, There is no one perfect solution that's best in all cases. I could tell you how to model up a part in SolidWorks that would make volume mill uh, appear to be at its worst and make adaptive uh, appear to be at its best. And honestly, if you work in a shop that makes only that type of part, you know, don't even look at volume mill. However, if you spread this across the literally unlimited uh, number of shapes you can have in, in a milled part. Uh, on average, across all of those in the general case, volume mill has proven to be um, the top performer as far as material removal rates, uh, cutting tool life, uh, cycle time reductions, etc. Well, so. I, I think too, it, there's, a, there's also an understanding of feeds and speeds here that changes too, correct? Because when, when you're looking at unified chip load, your, your feeds and speeds need to be set for the optimal chip load, not just the old school, I machine a pocket, so I set it at 3 thou per tooth at this depth of cut, and away I go. You, you, you have to have new feeds and speeds to make an optimum chip. That's, that's exactly right. And, and the way that works is um, um, by, by I'll have some images to, to, to help illustrate this, but by keeping the cut width constant, even though we know if you go into a counterclockwise arc, the angle of engagement is going to increase, the chip will get longer, the chip will get thicker. But if you know this is going to happen and plan for it, you can reduce the feed rate so that you now get the same uh, thickness of chip as you were getting before. But the toolpath has to be planned carefully in order to make this possible. So one of the principles of, of volume mill is um, that if you think about it, milling doesn't make parts, right? Milling uh, makes chips. Part is what's left over after the chips are, are made. 
um, and you make a lot of chips. So a five fluid end mill at 15,000 RPM makes 75,000 chips per minute. Um, so chips are actually the product of the milling process. They're not the debris. Um, the, the part is what's left over. Of course, that's what's important. But the best way to get that part to free it from the block of the material is to be very diligent in how you make all these chips in order to leave the part behind. You guys might be too young. Back in the 90s, there was a sitcom called uh, Home Improvement with Tim Allen. And uh, there were a lot of crazy characters in it. And my favorite was his next door neighbor, Wilson. He would always talk to over the back fence. And uh, one day he looks over the fence and Wilson's got his head down and he's banging away at a log with a hammer and chisel. And uh, Tim says, well, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm just carving out a canoe, Tim. And Tim paused for a second and said, well, that sounds hard. And Wilson says, well, not really, Tim. You just start with the log and then chip away everything that's not a canoe. Well, that's what the part is. The, the part is what's left over after all the chips, all the other material is chipped away. So really what milling does is make chips. So it's of utmost importance to control the formation of the chip. I mean, if you're not controlling what you're making, then I, I'm not sure what you are controlling. And the chip thickness, as, as you were just uh, referring to, is a function of spindle speed, feed per tooth, and cut width. And if any one of those things changes, the chip thickness will change. So it's not necessarily easy to keep these things under control. But, you know, as, as the picture shows here, the tool's rotating. Here it's entering the material at about a 30 degree angle. Um, and the load chart on the right shows that as soon as that flute makes content with the material, since we're climb milling, the chip is at its thickest here. And uh, so it's got the highest load, and this is where the, the heaviest cut's gonna be. As it continues to rotate through the material, of course, the chip's getting thinner, and the load immediately begins to decrease. And the farther you uh, rotate through, the more this goes. Now, of course, it's a bit more complicated than this because the tool's actually moving forward as it's also rotating here. So, but that's uh, kind of uh, unavoidable. Um, and then when you get down to the end, of course, your, your load has gone to zero, the, the chip is completely formed. Now, if you look at this, uh, again, what you were talking about, Mike, if, if, if you have a 50% step over, in other words, your cut width is uh, equal to the tool radius, then your chip thickness is equal to the feet per tooth because that's as thick as that chip can possibly be. And you can see what the, uh, the load is as you sweep through here. It starts uh, high and then, then goes to zero uh, when, when you get 90 degrees into the cut. If you reduce that step over, in this case, we've got an example of 10%, the feet per tooth is actually greater than the chip thickness and it's significantly greater. And as it rotates, this chip thickness uh, decreases, but it doesn't decrease linearly. In other words, if you go from 50% uh, step over to 40% step over, you're gonna have a very slight uh, reduction in chip thickness. You go from 10% to 5%, it's gonna increase much more or decrease much more quickly. But you see what happens with the load. You enter the, the cut much, more, uh, much later, so you're in the cut for a much shorter period of time. So your load is nowhere near as heavy as it was uh, on the, the higher um, step over or cut width. And this is a great thing. And you can take advantage of this. And the way you take advantage of it is by increasing the feed rate. So in order to get the chip at a 10% step over to be equal to the chip at a 50% step over, you have to increase the feed rate by 67%, and that'll get you here. So your peak load is the same, but look at what we have here. We're still in the cut for a much shorter duration. So this gives us further opportunities. And this is where the principle of work comes in from physics. Now, I am not a physicist, so anybody out there listening to this, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm repeating what I've been told, but, uh, work is equal to the force times the displacement or the distance through which the, the force is acting. So if you look at the chart of uh, 
how work uh, comes into play as a function of the step over. With a bigger step over, you're doing this amount of work. With the smaller step over, even though we've adjusted the feed rate, in this case by increasing it by 67%, so we're cutting much faster, the amount of work we're doing is really greatly reduced, as you can see from the charts. This gives us further opportunities. The most obvious one is, hey, let's start spinning the tool faster. And if you spin the tool faster, faster at the same feed per tooth, you're gonna be feeding the tool faster. And that way you can get the, the level of work up to where you want it to be. So you're removing material so much faster, even though your step over is much smaller. Of course, the other uh, important fact here is by reducing the radial depth of cut like this, we can increase the axial depth of cut greatly and more than make up for um, uh, any excess toolpath length that we have here. So, so this function of work, uh, at 10% step over, it's less than half uh, the amount of work that has, is being done at, uh, actually less than a third of the work that's being done at a 50% step over. And, and the other part of the work though too is your, your tool, because you're going on a more axial depth of cut, your tool is more uniformly loaded, but you're also not beating the machine to death. That's right. And, and what's important here is for any given step over and depth of cut, axial depth of cut, so axial and radial depth of cut, you can arrive at an ideal spindle speed and feed rate for whatever material you're cutting, whatever cutting tool you're using, whichever machine tool, fixture rigidity, any of these things that you have, you can arrive at that. Um, but only as long as that cut width stays constant. Now imagine what happens if you had a cut that began at 10% and you've optimized the feed and speed for that, and then all of a sudden the cut width goes to 20%. Well, you're, now you're going way too fast. Your chips are gonna get too long, they're gonna get too thick, you'll probably get tool failure. Um, same thing if you calculate them for 50%, then you go to 10%, well, you're just wasting time. And you may be actually just burnishing material instead of actually cutting it. So this, what I have on the screen here now, this, this is nothing new. I mean, this isn't anything we did. This is just, just physics and, and geometry, I guess. Uh, you look at the way the, the, the two bodies interact. <clears throat> but to take advantage of physics and make physics work for you, requires designing a toolpath that will let physics work for, you, work for you. Now, I don't know of any machine tool that can dynamically change the feed rate or the spindle speed during a cut. And if, think about this, if this cut is tapering, if this is showing a four fluid end mill. If you wanted to uh, uh, change the spindle speed or the feed rate during a cut so that it uh, compensated for the changing width of cut, you would have to adjust it four times per revolution of the tool. And at 15,000 15, RPM, that's, you know, that's a lot of adjustments. Uh, and since uh, one feed rate, one block of code, uh, just the, uh, the length of the program itself would be outrageous. And again, uh, hardware being able to do this is, well, there's certainly none that I'm aware of, and I'd be surprised if there ever will be, but um, yeah, never say never, I suppose. But still, even if the hardware could do it, it would have to know somehow that the cut width was changing. So the best way to control the formation of the chip is to maintain the cut width. And uh, that's what volume mill does, which is what separates it from the other technologies. Does that kind of answer your question, Mike, or yeah. address your observation? Yeah, yeah, no, this, um, I mean, it, if you have unlimited resources and unlimited tooling, you may not run in you may not be as concerned about it, but when you're the person that has to buy the tooling and, and service the machine, <laughs> this kind of stuff becomes very important really quick, right? Because time is money, but tooling is money also. Um, it's, they're all factors and uh, they're, they're all very important factors. Um, that, that brings up a great point here. If you've got your axial depth of cut now really increasing, um, what is that doing, Glenn, for the, the tool life? Uh, what's it doing for, for the heat dissipation if we've got it over a larger length of the tool? Is there, what comes into play there? Uh, actually, some very good things come into play there. 
mostly it's in the form of uh, supporting the tool. So you're you're distributing the the cutting forces over the greater length of the tool. The tool's actually well, again, I'm not a physicist, but it, it's as if the tool is actually being supported by the material. Um, uh, an analogy that might work, although it's not uh, perfect. Um, if you take a you know 200 pound man and he walks out to the end of a diving board, that diving board's going to flex quite a bit if he's standing at the very end of it. Now, on the other hand, if you take four kids that weigh 50 pounds each and you line them up in the same area, you're going to get much less deflection on that diving board. Uh, so because the, the load is distributed over more of the object in this case, which is the cutting tool. So, so this smaller, is why... Smaller moment of inertia. Uh, yeah, if you say so. I, I think that's right. I've heard that term before. Um, and uh, it, it actually is greatly beneficial. What we found um, is, for example, a... a very common that people can use volume mill and cut, you know, two and a two, two to two and a half, three times the tool diameter for the axial depth of cut at, you know, you know, pretty uh, good step overs and, and get great performance. As that cut length changes, now you have uh, three, four, five times the tool diameter uh, for your length of cut on the flute and you're cutting that much deeper. What we found is and it's all backed up by physics, if you reduce the chip thickness, but significantly increase this, the surface footage, the surface speed, you'll get better results. I mean, most people would be inclined to slow everything down when you're uh, increasing the length of cut. It's just the opposite is true. You want to speed things up, but you have to compensate in other areas. And, and that is by increasing the spindle speed more than you increase the feed rate so that you um, uh, thin out the chips more. The chip is not as thick, but it's certainly a lot taller. Um, and we get better performance that way than slowing everything down. Uh, again, that kind of stuff is, is beyond my uh, ability to calculate, but um, thank gosh we have uh, other people here on staff who can do that sort of thing. Um, but that's uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. So are you able to reduce, I guess, the heat that the tool absorbs? Uh, yes, and, and that all falls out of this. I mean, when you're milling something, uh, turning something, whatever, but we're talking about milling today, uh, you're generating a great deal of heat through friction, right? You've got one solid body uh, overpowering another solid body. Um, right. You're generating a lot of heat. So the question is so, isn't so much, you know, not can we not generate the heat? No, you cannot not generate the heat. What you can do is control where that heat goes. Now, yes. by making chips of uniform size in uniform shape, you're going to get much greater uh, predictability in how the heat is dissipated. Right. You want that heat going out with the chips. I mean, a couple of things I, I was taught very early on, back in 1980, when I first started working in the shops, there were, there were a couple of uh, just absolutes. One is never, ever exceed the cutting tool manufacturer's recommendation for surface speed. Well, think about it. That's because you were jamming tools into the corner. That's right. We've proven that that's not true. We we double, triple, quadruple cutting tool manufacturers' uh, uh, SFM recommendations. Um, the other thing is you don't ever want to see a blue chip. Well, that's also not true. I love seeing blue chips. I really see right. a blue chip than a blue part. And um, the key is to make the chips uniform enough so that you can come up with feeds and speeds that give you predictable heat evacuation. I'm going to show you a video a little bit later. And um, on it, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the, the very slow motion version of it. But uh, when you watch the slow-mo version of it, the chips are coming off of this piece of P20, and they're this just gorgeous straw brown. But as they get you know, some distance away, you're flying through the air for a little bit, they turn blue, and then they hit. I've cut parts with volume mill where you're, you're done, you make this huge pile of chips. You can reach in and touch the part. The part is cool. You will feel the heat rising up from the chip bed. You'll feel that heat on your arm. Um, 
but that's where you want the heat. You want the heat in the chips. You don't want it in the tool. You certainly don't want it in the part. Um, that causes all kinds of problems, work hardening, deformation, all kinds of things that you want to avoid. So, so if, what, what I like to say is what Volumil does is establishes and maintains um, not ideal necessarily, but very advantageous and desirable machining conditions. And you don't want that to fluctuate. And the biggest reason that fluctuates is because of a change in the cut width. And so by keeping that constant, we keep these uh, uh, desirable machining conditions in play uh, for as long as, as possible. Um, and when you have these uh, good machining conditions, all kinds of good things happen. You can go faster, you can go deeper. Um, and you get better results. Cutting tools last longer. Parts don't warp. Uh, spindle bearings last longer. The load on the machine drops dramatically because you're not jamming this thing in the corners and overloading it. So nothing but good things can happen from using uh, uh, good machining conditions. And uh, promoting those, defining those, achieving them, and maintaining them is, is the key. So where did all this get us <laughs> it, to where we are now? Where, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Mike, the uh, virtually all CAM systems have some form of high speed milling, high efficiency milling, whatever you want to call it. But if you look at this, uh, it doesn't even have to be a very critical eye, but if you look at it, the roots of everything that you see today, certainly everything that I'm aware of, can be traced either to true mill, to adaptive clearing from pre-steel, or to volume mill. Nothing else out there is original. Um, you can look at any technology uh, or any toolpath generated by any CAD CAM company's technology. And once you're familiar with volume mill, true mill, and adaptive, you can look at whatever it's called. And uh, it's pretty clear to see where they got their ideas. So, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, about uh, Julian Todd and Martin Denshin, they're, they're, they're no longer involved. Uh, Dr. Sherbrooke and I are still involved. We're still maintaining this technology. We're still enhancing it. Uh, he and I have been involved in high efficiency uh, milling toolpath generation continuously for longer than anyone. And, um, and it, it, you know, we like to think that shows in our, our product, the way it uh, continues to grow, continues to improve. Uh, it's far from perfect. And um, we are continually striving to make it better. And, um, and we've got projects underway right now that are going to make significant uh, differences here. And that gets back to, you know, the, about the Julian and Martin being gone. It's kind of like to paraphrase uh, Rick Patino and he was coaching the Boston Celtics in the early 90s. You know, Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish had all retired and the fans were getting restless. And finally he said to them, look, you know, Bird, McHale and Parrish aren't walking through that door. Deal with it. So whoever's got whatever version of adaptive clearing, wherever they have it now, uh, Julian Todd and Martin Denshin aren't walking through that door. Uh, that doesn't mean that the people who have the stuff aren't capable of making improvements. Certainly they're all, they're, are, they're, they're all smart people, but it's not the originators. It's not the people who came up with the concept and have been growing it ever since. So I've mentioned ideal machining conditions a moment ago. Um, what exactly is an ideal milling condition? I mean, you have an interrupted cut, which is certainly not ideal. If you're on a lathe and you ever introduce an interrupted cut, you, you get in all kinds of trouble. But in milling, it's unavoidable. Uh, however many flutes the tool has and however fast it's spinning, that's how many thousands of times the, the, the cutting edges are entering and exiting the material per minute. But so what is an ideal condition? It's probably this, making a straight line cut along the edge of a block. Because when you're doing this, uh, there's a very simple formula that's in play, which is depth of cut times width of cut times feed rate equals uh, material removal rate in cubic inches per minute or cubic centimeters per minute if you're, if you're using metric. Um, so obviously, if you could do this all day, you, you'd be able to machine very, very uh, confidently, aggressively, and, and um, uh, predictably. But you can't make very many parts that look just like this, right? So 
So how do we deal with this? Well, let's look at something that's very simple, just a, a block like that, but you're just machining up to a shoulder with a toolpath on it. And this is just a parallel offset toolpath that every CAM system in the world can make. It's just a bunch of straight line cuts parallel to that, that shoulder that we're milling up to. Um, and since the opposite edge of the stock is parallel to that, uh, they're all uniform. If you look at it from the top, that's it. You really can't improve on this. This, this is as good as it gets. Your cut width is constant, so you can come up with a set of parameters that will be ideal for cutting this material on whatever machine you're using and whatever cutting tool you're using. I'm, I have to say somewhere, somehow, some salesperson is trying to tell a customer that their tool path in this condition is better than someone else's. Well, that would be interesting because <laughs> they're, they're all pretty much exactly the same. There are some exceptions, however, <laughs> as some, you'll see. Somebody, some sales guy always has some better uh, snake oil to, to sell, right? Um, Absolutely. <laughs> Never, never fails, never fails. But, you know, so this is what a parallel offset toolpath does, which would any toolpath, you know, been around from the 70s would do. Well, so if you throw volume mill at this, it looks virtually identical. Now the, the repositioning at the end of one cut to the beginning of the next is different. Here we're staying down very close to the work and just using an extremely high feed rate to get back to the beginning. But while the tools engage in the material, there's absolutely no difference here between a volume mill toolpath and a parallel offset toolpath. Why should there be? It's, you can't improve upon those cutting conditions. On the other hand, this is what an adaptive toolpath will do. Adaptive clearing, adaptive milling, adaptive roughing, dynamic milling, uh, whatever you want to call it. If it's adaptive, this is what it does. Remember back uh, at the beginning, I said that what it, how this adaptive technology works is it avoids overloading the cutter by just tracing the outline of the uh, stock boundary, whatever that is at the moment. Now you see this thing, the first cut to the last cut, it, it kind of a, a huge uh, difference between, between those cuts. That's because the shape of material keeps changing. So I've, I don't know if you ever question, you know, why do they call this adaptive? What is so adaptive about it? Well, I, I think it's this. So you're going to make a first cut here and where it always starts, unless the part is completely surrounded by material, in which case it will remove the outer material first. But once the part is no longer completely contained within the material, it's going to start at a point where the part geometry meets the stock uh, geometry. And it's going to start at that edge and it's going to follow it. Now, this edge right now is just three lines. It's a horizontal line on top, a vertical line on the right side, and a horizontal line at the bottom. Now, it's doing this. Now, it might look like it's overloading there, but it really isn't because the leading edge of the tool had broken through. So I think they're doing something with the engagement angle. I don't know for sure. I've never seen a written description of you know, their algorithm, how it works. Certainly never seen the code. That's just my observation based upon what I've read, what I see and my experience. So what's it do next? Well, it's going to do the exact same thing. The only difference is the material boundary, the stock boundary that's got a cut along is no longer just three straight lines. It's a bit more complicated. So this next cut is going to be just a bit more complicated. It's not going to violate anything. It's not going to uh, you know, prevent it from doing what it's supposed to do. It does work as designed. You are not overloading the cutter. You are um, just following that stock boundary. Uh, you start where it hits the part, you end when the tool hits the part. And that's what you do. So that's, I think, where the term adaptive comes from. It makes one cut along the initial stock boundary, and then it has to adapt the next cut to the now different material boundary that was left as a result of the previous cut. That's just my guess. Uh, if, if someone knows better, please let me know. But um, you could see, as I mentioned, the, this material boundary keeps changing and getting more and more complicated until you get way down the middle. If you just look at this toolpath, you would think this is completely burying the tool. It isn't. It's just if you're controlling an engagement angle, which I believe they are in some way, shape, or form, um, as this geometry boundary that you're cutting along gets more complex, 
the motion, the path the tool has to follow in order to cut that geometry without over engaging can get quite crazy. Um, now, and there you have it. <laughs> and that's what an adaptive toolpath does. Uh, it, my observation, that's what it always does. It just uh, nibbles away at the edge of the stock. Um, we used to work with the guys at CNC Software quite a bit uh, when we first uh, released Volumil. Actually, the very first CAM system it ran inside of was MasterCAM. Um, and they got some good guys there. And one of them who was in charge of their dynamic milling uh, project told me he just called it a stock gobbler. And I think that's a great description. It just gobbles along the edge of the stock. Uh, whether or not it makes sense to do it, that's what it does. So does it make sense? Let's change the machining conditions a little bit. Instead of just a square shoulder, we've got uh, uh, this, you know, it's really just three arcs uh, breaking out on one edge of the edge of the block here. I call these non-ideal cutting conditions because it's not straight line it's on the edge of a block. Anywhere you'd see a parallel offset toolpath have a sharp corner in it, that means you've got to do something to avoid that. So this is what volume mill does. Um, there's nothing linear about the part geometry we're cutting. Um, so there's no, there's no straight line moves in this toolpath at all. These arcs that you see uh, progressing into the, into the part, these are all equally spaced. If this were true mill, these would not be equally spaced. The smaller arcs would be closer together than each successive arc would get slightly and slightly farther apart because the larger the arc, the smaller the increase in engagement angle. But we don't control the engagement angle. So what we do is we plan this toolpath so that we can remove the volume of material by keeping a constant cut width. But since we know we've got these counterclockwise arcs in here, we adjust the feed rate as we enter these arcs, actually slightly before, so at the time we, the engagement angle has increased, we are already at the now ideal feed rate for the new longer chip. If your engagement angle is greater, the chip is longer. If the chip is longer, it's going to get thicker. We don't want it to get thicker, so we reduce that feed rate so that the chip is the same thickness as it normally would be. It's just a little longer. This also normalizes the amount of work that each flute does when it's shearing that chip off of the material, actually making, forming that chip. So that's what the volume mill would do. This is what an adaptive toolpath would do. Um, it's hard to see exactly. I, these aren't straight lines, but it enters up at the top and then cuts along parallel or right along that stock boundary, which is what it always does. You mentioned the chiplet thing. I've noticed that on my machine when I watch the load meter, um, especially when I'm pushing the limit of it with a big tool. Um, I, I've i noticed that. In this case, it looks like it makes perfect sense. Yes. Uh, with volume mill, you'll, you'll, and probably with adaptive too, uh, you're going to see um, uh, a much narrower band of where that, that, that needle's uh, bouncing around on, on your load meter. Um, you know, one example I know when we first started out, there was a company running, a, it was a Haas, I think VF2, they're cutting titanium and uh, like at six inches a minute or something, and it was pegging that meter. I mean, it, the meter would go up to 150%, I think, and it was constantly running up or continually, repeatedly hitting 120, 130%. We replaced it with the volume mill toolpath in the same part, cutting at 100 inches per minute, you know, and, and three or four times deeper now, not nearly as is wide actually, of course, but the meter was running very consistently between, uh, I think it was 16 and 20%. Um, so even though we're going much, much faster, we're actually being kinder and gentler to all the hardware that's involved. And, uh, and I think you would get similar benefits from something like this with adaptive as well, especially in a, in a geometric configuration like this. It's following the stock boundary, um, and again, after the first cut, that stock boundary has changed, so it follows the new stock boundary. But this should actually work pretty well, and actually looks kind of logical on the on the face of it. So what happens? We change this a little bit. Let's slide that uh, little uh, boomerang shape farther down the block, so that we now not have just one uh, stock boundary edge, but we have three, kind of like what we had on the square shouldered part. Well, again, parallel offset toolpath has a sharp corners. So we need to avoid those. 
So this is what volume mill does. Kind of similar to the other one, but notice as when we get these stock boundaries, we cut right through them. Those stock boundaries have to be eliminated. You have to remove all that stock. We cut straight through those, not literally straight, but I think you know what I mean. We, we just go right at it versus adaptive, which is going to nibble along the edge. Again, whether it makes sense to or not, um, this is what it always does. So it starts at the where the stock meets the part, ends when it hits the part, uh, rinse and repeat. And you can see it self-adapting the shape of each cut as the um, new material boundary is formed as a result of the previous cut. So I, I have to bring up one question that I'm sure somebody is watching this. Um, if you look at the, the offset roughing, someone may say, well, I can, I can have it automatically put radiuses in there and change the feed rate and the radius on offset roughing and I won't have a sharp point. But I, I think the flip side of that is, is you're still creating a higher level of engagement even with an arc because of the fact that um, the, the radius needs to vary as the cut changes, correct? Um, what, what you're saying is accurate. The, the many, probably most CAD CAM companies back in the 90s uh, smoothed these sharp corners with you know, adding small radius arcs in them. As I think I mentioned earlier, that's that's of little use. You're still getting a, a huge increase in effective cut width because, as I mentioned, the smaller the toolpath radius is, the greater the engagement angle. So maybe you're not buried at 180 degrees of the uh, periphery of the tool, but maybe you're at 150. <laughs> still not good. And it just depends on, on the, the size of the arc you put in. Another thing that happens when you do this is there are two feed rates that you have to be concerned with. One, of course, is the program feed rate, and that's how fast the, the tool is moving at the center of the tool. And if you're cutting along on a straight line, the edge of the tool, which is the point where the chip is actually being shorn from the material, is going the same speed as your programmed feed rate. If you enter a counterclockwise arc, again, assuming climb milling, the periphery of that tool where that chip is actually being shorn from the material, that feed rate is now going much, much faster than your programmed feed rate. And if you don't compensate for that, this is where you look at parts for that and it, it, you know, the, the surface finish on the straight part is so much better than it is in the corners because you know, it, each of the flutes has taken a huge chip because the actual effective feed rate at the edge of the tool gets uh, astronomically ridiculous. <laughs> and the larger your cutting tool diameter and the smaller that radius that you add to eliminate the sharp corner, the, the worse that uh, increase in effective feed rate is. So just adding those small arcs is not a solution. Tricoidal tool pass that came out and just filled the whole area with little circles, not a good solution. I mean, those are, um, they're band-aids. They're trying to treat the symptom of the problem but they're, they're not actually addressing the problem. They're not removing the undesirable machining conditions and making sure those don't exist in the toolpath. They're detecting when they are there and then trying to do something about it. Uh, there are other technologies out there that will um, you know, uh, analyze your toolpath after you've made it. And when the, it's removing more material than you want it to, it'll slow the feed rate. If it's removing less material than you want it to, it'll increase the feed rate. Those are all what I call detect and adjust um, approaches. You detect when something's wrong and then you do something to try to address it. Unfortunately, all they can ever possibly do is adjust the feed rate. Does it help? Absolutely. Is it, does it solve the problem? No, it's, um, like I said, it's a Band-Aid. It, it's treating the symptom of the disease. It's not treating the disease. So what we try to do is treat the disease so that we never have um, these undesirable machining conditions prop up in the first place. You're, you don't need to detect when something's wrong and then try to adjust for it because ideally nothing's ever wrong in the first place. So this is something that uh, people who use volume will tell us and you probably know this from your own experience, you, you start cutting apart. If it sounds good when you first start, you could probably just walk away because it's going to sound good throughout the whole thing. Uh, the cutting conditions don't change. So That is a great point. So if you're a machinist and 
you know, if when I when I listen to uh, <clears throat> the volume mill toolpaths, they don't change. You're absolutely right, Glenn. That sound and that loading remains constant, and mm -hmm. that alone, my ear tells me as a machine is so much of what's going on with the cutter and what's happening inside the machine tool. And you're absolutely right. Um, you know, once I, once I get buried, um, or, or once once the tool begins uh, to make its cut, and it's made a couple of those cuts, I feel comfortable with it with my ear, and I look at my load meter, and I'm comfortable with where it's at. You're right, I walk away. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's very reassuring um, <laughs> that to, to be able to do that. Uh, I remember when I was in the shop running CNC machines, I mean, I had to stand there in many cases with my hand on the feed override dial. And uh, when something bad started to happen, I had to slow it down manually. Um, yeah. Those days hopefully are gone if you're using the proper uh, toolpath uh, engine to, to generate your motion for you. And again, this all gets back to, uh, as I said earlier, uh, it's because of consistent machining conditions, uniform chip formation, uniform amount of work required to form each chip, which gives you the opportunity to control your heat evacuation. And um, yeah, it, you should hear a buzz in the machine, not chirps and groans. Um, shouldn't be a lot of vibration uh, if you put your hand on the machine. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, the, the load meter will, will tell you a lot of this. So yeah, I'm glad, glad to hear that uh, that's been your experience. Very much so. So this, and then to kind of, summarize these um, algorithmic differences between uh, volume mill and, and adaptive, uh, and even going all the way back to the basic parallel offset toolpath. If you look at it this way, parallel offset toolpath always follows the part geometry. It's made by offsetting the part geometry by the step over and then trimming those offsets up and sewing them back together. An adaptive toolpath does the opposite. It always follows the stock boundary. Uh, whether or not it makes sense to do so. It's the only thing it does. It does it uh, reliably, it does it efficiently, it does it effectively, but that's all it does. A volume mill toolpath, on the other hand, analyzes the entirety of the volume of material that's gonna be removed with the current toolpath, and then plans a path that moves through that material in and out uh, as necessary so that we maintain constant cut width, which allows us to control the formation of each chip and the amount of work that goes into making each chip and the amount of heat that's evacuated with each chip. So I guess the, a one sentence or a two sentences separated by a semicolon is adaptive always follows the stock boundary. The volume will always cuts right through it. It, it does not let the stock boundary edge uh, influence the cutting motion at all. Uh, that stock boundary is going to be gone. Uh, why should it be what drives the motion of the toolpath? It has to be gone, otherwise you failed. So again, volume mill will do this. Adaptive will do that. Volume mill will do this. Adaptive will do that. Volume mill will do this. Back to the same thing a parallel offset toolpath will do. And adaptive will do that. And here, just visually, this just seems counterintuitive. I mean, uh, you're cutting a, a square shoulder parallel to the opposite edge of the block. Why do anything but a bunch of parallel straight line cuts? Um, another. I, I know this is a dumb question, but I'm going to ask this. I look at this adaptive path versus the straight line path. Um, is the adaptive path, is the tool path longer? I, you know, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to measure it out. Um, okay. You'd have to, uh, you know, actually measure the toolpath length. I mean, clearly the first few cuts of this just seem silly, right? It's kind of like if you want to go to your next door neighbor's house and he lives one door to your left, but you go down to your walk, you turn left, you go down one house, your neighbor's house. This is kind of like you go down to the end of your walk. And instead of going left, you turn right and go around the block to get to your neighbor's house. Um, but as this gets closer and closer, the repositioning moves from the end of one cut to the beginning of the next get shorter. 
uh, which is different from the parallel offset or volume mill where the repositioning move is the same length every time. Um, the only way to know for sure is to cut it on a machine. Uh, you can get a pretty good idea if you generate both of these inside of the same CAD CAM system if there's a system that has both of these and uh, you can measure the toolpath length. Yes. Uh, our experience, empirical uh, data that has come to us uh, suggests or even even shows that uh, uh, the volume mill toolpath is going to be more efficient. Um, now, a volume mill toolpath is certainly longer than a parallel offset toolpath. Maybe not in this case where it's nothing but parallel lines, but in all the other examples I showed, the volume mill toolpath is going to have a greater toolpath length. The beauty is that we can go so much faster that we make up for that excess length uh, many times over. Now. How does adaptive compare to either parallel offset or to volume mill? We'd have to see, but um, we consistently remove material faster with longer tool life. Uh, and I say consistently, and not always. Again, there are situations where uh, what this adaptive stuff does is just better suited to, to a certain uh, Uh, geometric configuration because that's just not the case uh, we understand this and, and we continue to try to, to make our uh, toolpath better so that we can um, you know uh, shore up the areas where, where we're not as efficient as we, as we possibly can be again that gets back to dr. Sherbrooke and, and I still being involved with this all day every day um, it's not been passed down off to somebody else or sold to somebody else or kicked down the street at all we are still uh, the ones that are doing this. So uh, we, we like our chances. But yeah, it's a good question. Um, it would probably be easy enough to figure out. I just don't know an answer on the top of my head. Uh, Glenn, can I assume that you guys own a machine tool? Is that right? We do not, actually. Um, okay. We're a relatively small company, and, and uh, I work from my home in, in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have more people in Moore Park, California, which is where our headquarters is, than we have anywhere else. But most of us work uh, out of our homes, uh, wherever we might be. So we don't have a machine tool. Um, in the early days, what we did is went around to community colleges and, and uh, people we knew who we'd done work with before, and, and they, they gave us access to machines. So we did our testing. Now we've just got so many customers using this that uh, the feedback we get is, uh, uh, you know, virtually nonstop, and um, it's it's um, it would be nice if we had one. I th I think, but it's at this stage in our uh, existence, I don't think it's necessary. I remember I think Delcam was a company uh, that I think had actually a, a fully functioning, I mean, profit generating machine shop as part of the company. Mm -hmm. That would be that would be very cool. Uh, yeah, we we don't we don't have that. <laughs> Your technology is so widely adopted. When you go to make improvements, and you talked about being able to make improvements, and you're always working on volume mill, I suspect that's probably true with volume turn. Um, you really don't need to test that on a machine. You know by looking at the tool pass and the different geometry scenarios that you're going to run into, you know where the improvement needs to be, right? Generally, that is true. Uh, most things that we do, we, we're very confident that we're improving what we have, um, but we're not necessarily uh, changing the machining dynamic or machining conditions that we establish unless we know it's for the better. There are the occasional enhancements, though, that, um, that come through where we absolutely do have to get on a machine to, to prove it out. Um, okay. Because remember, in, in, in practice, theory isn't the same as practice. so. Um, we, we, when we required, and it is sometimes required, depending on the enhancement, we absolutely make sure we, we cut metal. And uh, a variety mm -hmm. of materials with a variety of tools and a variety of machines. And um, we certainly have access to, to machine tools through uh, customers and um, other partners. Um, so we have it when we need it. It's not been a, uh, a limiting factor for us at all. Can I assume then that, um as you as you uh, come out with newer versions 
and improved technology that you actually have beta customers that will beta test this on their machines? Absolutely, yes. Okay, very yeah. good. Yep. Yeah, uh, nothing gets released without being uh, thoroughly beta tested and, and um, especially if it's, you know, they're, they're, we've made all kinds of different enhancements throughout the years, um, some of which uh, don't have anything to do necessarily with the actual cutting of the metal. <laughs> Maybe it's a different way to reposition the tool or, or rounding corners or hitting flats or, or things like this, but it doesn't affect the actual toolpath algorithm itself. In other words, when the tool is engaged in the material, nothing has changed. Gotcha. There, and those are much easier to deal with, obviously. The right. uh, other ones uh, that, that we do have, because we are still continually improving the toolpath, when we do make changes that affect what we call the toolpath engine, you know, what actually makes uh, all this motion, that has to be thoroughly tested, not just on screen, but, uh, but on machine tools. And, and we make sure that we do that. So I've got I've got a, a dumb question here, but is there a kind of a a scenario where there's kind of um, some geometry that um, is very difficult for volume mill? Let's just say it's a it's an unusual set of geometry. Let's call it death geometry. That <laughs> you feed to volume mill and you know ahead of time. Oh my gosh, we're going to have a hard time here because of this or that in the technology. And if you've identified some of that, is that where some of your enhancements go to to overcome those type of situations? Um, it, it depends on, on the specific situation. Uh, and, you know, one thing comes to mind right away. I mean, if, if you want to make volume, it'll look as inefficient as possible. Take a huge square plate, maybe two inches thick, and machine away at it so that you leave a bunch of, uh, say you're using a half-inch diameter cutter, leave a bunch of square or round bosses sticking up in kind of a rectangular array that have barely enough room between them for the, the cutting tool to fit. The volume mill is going to suffer at that because of the rules that we have to follow to maintain uniform chip formation, etc. Um, it just kind of puts handcuffs on us in, a, in an area like that. Okay. Um, the adaptive stuff would probably work much better in that case. And as I said at the beginning of this, if that's what you make, then okay, you know what your options are. But okay. those, that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah, those those um, you know, because you have cuts which breaking into a an area that you've already cut, and and uh, and those just aren't super common situations uh, in the general case. So quite honestly, we're not spending a great deal of effort on that because although someone, one of our competitors, could show that, and I just told them how to do it and, and make us uh, it look uh, far from <laughs> our best. But, you know, in the real world, that doesn't happen all that often. Right. So, you know, we pick our battles and, and we try to put our resources to where we get the, the biggest benefit to the, the majority of our customers. Uh, not something necessarily that's going to uh, take a lot of development effort to maybe help, a, you know, help us look better in a, a certain situation because they're out there. Um, they they just are. Anybody tells you any different is is being disingenuous. So uh, I don't want to be that. But you know we let others speak for us. Uh, the Wilhelm Bucher University in in Germany did a uh, a test. Well, not the university itself. There was a, a student uh, I think going for his master's, and he did this study as as his thesis, and he compared. Um, Parallel offset toolpaths, just regular standard stuff. Adaptive milling, uh, well, adaptive clearing, I guess, and uh, volume mill, and also eye machining from um, solid cam. And if looking at just adaptive and uh, volume mill, these were the results. There were four different parts, a, a pretty simple prismatic part, a mold core, a mold cavity, and then just kind of a face milling, which was taking the machined mold core that you see there in red and just flattening it, facing it down to, to start over with on the block. And these are the some of the results. I mean, the volume mill toolpath and it used the, the, the gentleman who did the thesis, as I mentioned earlier, programmed part and ran the machine with volume mill and adaptive both. So we had zero input. We didn't know about this until it was over. At least I didn't. 
But this is what we got for that, um, on average over all four parts, volume mill was you know, roughly 40% faster in machining time. Uh, obviously faster in material removal rates, uh, even in programming time, it was faster and he, he clocked all of this stuff. And one that's really interesting is the workpiece temperature. You know, with volume mill again, as I mentioned, our heat evacuation, um, because of our uniform chip formation and the non-variance of the cut width that is required in order to get that uniform chip formation. Um, the workpiece temperatures were measured with a laser thermometer after, uh, after each was cut, and ours were significantly cooler. And each of those dots uh, represents one of the four parts. The other charts are all yeah. averages. Yeah, that is a very interesting chart right there. Yeah, and, and so what this was, was just mild steel, European designations are different, but it's as close as we could determine, it's like a 1045 steel equivalent. It was with a 12 millimeter diameter four fluid, as you see, 9,000 RPM. Now the machine would go 12,000 RPM, so why they use nine, I don't know. Again, we had no input. Um, the inch equivalent to their millimeters per minute was 472, that's going pretty quick. Used a very aggressive uh, uh, feed per tooth. Um, one millimeter cut width, and you see the axial depth of cut, and you know got this about 16 and a quarter inches, uh, cubic inches of uh, material per minute removed. But these are very conservative parameters for volume mill. And again, we weren't involved in this, and we still won the comparison uh, handily. Now, this is not to say that you pick any random part out of any shop in the world that we're going to be 40 percent faster than adaptive. That's probably not going to be the case. That's what happened to be the case here. And if you look at this geometry, I can, uh, you know, make my own observations as, as to why. Of course, the author of the paper made his observations too, and it's published. Anybody can go read this. Um, didn't include I, I machining in, in this chart that I'm sharing with you because th th there's a bit of a longer story there. But um, these parameters are conservative for volume mills. So to put that in perspective, uh, this is what we done in, in uh, P20 tool steel. Uh, the half inch diameter tool, very similar, but we ran at 15,000 RPM. It's just under 2,000 surface feet per minute in P20. 400 inches per minute, now that's a much smaller uh, feed per tooth. Uh, cut width about the same. The depth of cut's probably about 50% deeper than the other one went. Material removal rate about the same in a material that's much, much uh, more difficult to machine than, than uh, mild steel. And this is what it looks like. Um, and pay attention to the sound of this if, as this comes through. As we were talking about <coughs> earlier, excuse me, the sound you hear when it starts, that's the sound you're gonna hear throughout. And it's just this nice, beautiful buzz. And you can't see the color of the chips here except maybe at the very end. But the, when it's in the cut, it sounds the same always. So be just a few more seconds, we'll let it run. So if you look down to the uh, lower right corner of that block, you can see a couple of blue chips there. Now these chips obviously went flying a long way, and uh, but, but they are blue. But as I mentioned earlier, they are not blue when they are coming off the part. Yeah. If chips are blue. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So, uh, yeah, that I tell you what, that sounded beautiful. It, there was no change. And and you you two are used to that from your your own experience, right? So, um, and that's the kind of the beauty of volume mill with the um, this idea of establishing and maintaining uh, ideal machining conditions or as close to ideal as you can get, no matter what the shape of the part is, because of the rules we follow. I mean, the tool path in one part doesn't necessarily look anything like a volume mill tool bath in another part. You know, again, contrasting with that with, with, that with adaptive, which they all look kind of the same, because um, they're kind of specifically engineered for the volume of the material that's being removed. And so it doesn't matter if you have this huge, powerful machine with, you know, super fast spindle speed, and high feed rate capabilities, and tons of torque and horsepower, or if you have something that's very small in meek, volume mill's not going to be the weak link in the chain. It's not going to be what limits how fast a given machine can go. 
it's the machine that's going to be the limit or the cutting tool or the fixturing or the coolant it'll be something else it won't be the tool path so you know just kind of summarizing um accepting that no machine at least none that i'm used to can dynamically update spindle speeds or feed rates certainly during a single revolution of the tool if the chip thickness or the chip thickness will change if the cut width changes so we make sure that our cut width doesn't change that enables us through a simple feed rate reduction because everything's planned and we know when this changes cut width is coming now the cut spacing doesn't change but the engagement angle will increase um, so knowing when that's going to happen we can reduce the feed rate so we're doing the same amount of work to make each chip and the chip thickness is uniform chips will be longer but they won't be any thicker and the only way to do this is with a constant with the cut and that's what we that's what we provide i've had two different people uh smart people <laughs> high up people at two different companies who uh sell this adaptive technology uh, again however they got it um whether they you know wrote it themselves after looking what was at what was already done or bought it or licensed it i don't know um but they both told me and these are smart people that adaptive toolpath technology works by maintaining a constant feed rate but then varying the cut width in order to keep a constant chip thickness unfortunately that's just not physically possible so this to me is you know where are julian and martin i, I don't think they would have made those same claims because they invented this stuff the people who have this now and who are selling it did not invent it and i'm not even sure how clearly they understand what they have um so that's that's that in a nutshell that i mentioned i machining just a moment ago um the reason uh, they kind of fell out of that comparison they're in the the full report a uh, uh, thesis if you care to read it um but i left it out here because it was getting too complicated but uh, i machining if you look at an i machining toolpath say in that pocket say in that prismatic part that was used in this test it will look virtually identical to an adaptive toolpath. It does pretty much the same exact thing. But they um, added to this by using something that they call a morphine spiral. The premise of this is by just keeping the tool continuously engaged in the material, you avoid the um, detrimental effects of entering and exiting the material. And though there are some detrimental effects there. Um, we compensate for those we, so we don't avoid entering and exiting the material. As you saw, we just go right through that material boundary uh, whenever we need to. Now, this is kind of their claim to fame of these morphine spirals, but even that's not original. They didn't come up with that idea. Um, in the late 90s or very early 2000s at the Boeing company, a gentleman named uh, Michael Biederman uh, designed an algorithm that would morph a spiral into any shape. And um, they did this for an own, their own internal use within Boeing. I think they even filed for a patent on it. Um, it hardly matters because you know, who came up with the idea? Because once you, you know, spirals are great if you're cutting a circular shape. Morphing a spiral into anything other than a circle only causes bad things to happen. You're guaranteed that you are going to have a varying width of cut. And if we look at this part that was used, um, uh, excuse me, this is uh, got ahead of myself just a little bit here. Um, let's come back to these because this was just kind of a wrap up. If we look at this part that um, was used at this university study, if you notice at the corners of the part, like there's a, a much greater distance between the edge of the stock here and the part here than there is here, or certainly than there is here. Well, Salicam insisted the only way they would participate in the study was if they programmed the part and they ran the machines. So they spent their two best guys from Germany or in Germany to do this because that's where the study took place. And they took a different tack. They used a bigger step overs. They used a higher spindle speed than the, the gentleman who did the study used. Um, they used a much slower feed rate too. Um, but the thing that really cost them on this part is with this non-uniform amount of material being removed around the edge, 
trying to keep the tool consistently engaged meant that their cuts were much farther apart here than they were here, and certainly much farther apart than they were here. And so in iMachining, if you look at their online videos or their snapshots or their UI, you know, they talk about a max uh, engagement angle and a minimum engagement angle, whether or not that's what they call it, that's what they are. So they specifically ask from the user, you know, how large can the engagement angle be and how small can it be? And they keep it between that. What they're doing is deliberately burying the width of cut, which as we've seen is, um, <coughs> you know, perhaps ill-advised. But what happened to them here with the, the um, at the speeds they were running. Um, we have a video of this also, but I'm just gonna show a snapshot. Excuse me, one second. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to get a quick drink of water. The um, heat that is generated by the friction is much greater in the areas where the cuts are closer together. Uh, in this particular case, their maximum angle of engagement was 48 degrees, which equates to uh, just about two millimeters of a cut width. Put it in perspective, uh, the guy used volume mill, for volume mill and adaptive use one millimeter, and that was never exceeded in those products. Here it went to 78 thousandths of an inch, almost two millimeters. At the 10% engagement, the step over is uh, three and a half thousandths. That's the spacing between the cuts. Um, so the chip thickness had to be almost non-existent. Um, you're pretty much rubbing and burnishing the material, uh, trying to rub it away rather than cut it off. I mean, the, the edge prep on the flute edge is probably greater than that. So the result was, as they ran through this, they, this happened. I mean, the tool just turned cherry red and shortly after this, it snapped. Um, you can even see where the part's turning blue because of all that heat. Uh, the chips are not uniform. They're going from very long to extremely thin, uh, long and thick to extremely short and extremely thin. So you can't get any predictable heat evacuation. And um, that this is what you should expect. They redid this, changed some things and completed the part. But those four parts, both volume mill and adaptive cut all four parts with one tool. It took iMachining four tools to do that, counting this one that they, that they snapped here. So this, I, I show you this um, to, try to reinforce the importance of chip formation. Again, we believe that the product of a milling process is a chip. The part's the benefit that's left behind after you've made the chips. If you're concentrating on following stock boundaries or keeping the tool continuously engaged with the material, whether or not it makes sense, whether or not it's a good machining practice, whether or not it uh, sets up good machining dynamics, um, you're not focusing on on the real thing at hand. People talk like that in the shop all the time, right? You've probably said it. Come on, let's let's make some chips. We're not making money if we're not making chips. So people talk like that, but how many actually stop and and think about it as to it's a chip we're making, not the part. We're just making a whole boatload of chips uh, in order to get a part that's left over. So that's uh, kind of the uh, story there just trying to reinforce the importance of the chip formation which of course is what we pride ourselves on and uh, of course with volume mill running inside of uh, SolidWorks cam uh, I hope this is of great interest to your your customers and I'll just run these videos this is a part um, just to show one slice of this uh, just verification but the difference between how an adaptive toolpath would attack this versus how volume mill attacks it. Again, you'll see that the adaptive is driven completely by whatever the shape of the stock boundary is at the moment and where volume mill is not. So, this is the volume mill toolpath entering and exiting the material. Of course, we do feed rate adjustments to. Uh, compensate for the fact that you know the first couple of chips aren't thinning all the way down to zero um, but I think you get the idea it's it's not following the stock boundary we're cutting right through it it's not an offset of the part boundary we eventually get to the shape of the part of course but it's uh, on a route that is planned because of the specific shape and relationship to the material edges and the part edges 
that we have to work with here. That's very impressive. Thank you. We, you know, it, it's it's proven to work, and uh, that's that's kind of our motto: volume mill because it works, um, and it'll work anywhere, any machine, any material, any cutting tool. Uh, it will not be what limits your ability to get your parts cut. Um, it will help you cut them faster than you've been able to before. Um, you know, and reduce cycle times are important. That that translates to increased shop capacity. If you can cut a part four times faster, then you can cut four times as many parts in a shift. So I think I need to back up another step to get the, um, this is the uh, way adaptive we go about this. Now in this case, this probably isn't very real bad because the, um, the starting point is not very far from the ending point. So, you know, it, it starts at the part, cuts around the edge of the block, gobbling that stock, ends when it hits the part on the other side, then repositions back. But clearly, this is just following, cutting right along the edge of whatever that stock boundary might be. Mm -hmm. Same thing every time. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't have its, its place. It, it's it's going to work much, much better than a parallel offset toolpath in, in almost every case, I would imagine. Except maybe if you're cutting you know, parallel to a straight wall. It doesn't do a very good job of that. It doesn't like to. It sounds like it does much better than a morphing spiral as well under certain circumstances. Yeah, I mean, the difference between what this does, this cuts around the outside, but you notice it's not trying, insisting to keep that uh, tool engaged at all times. It, um, when it hits the part, it's going to stop and it's going to re-enter the material someplace else. That morphing stuff, spiral approach where you just keep it engaged at all times is just, um, I, I, it's just curious to me. Um, what potential benefit they they think could come from that i'm i'm not sure but uh, that's uh those are all the the slides i have here i'm happy to continue the discussion for as long as you'd like as long as you think makes sense did we yeah, answer all your questions yeah it's fascinating to watch um and especially to watch these comparisons between the different technologies I mean, you obviously understand them all very, very well. Um, I can say this too, you know, you talk about the different range of machine tools that you're able to run volume mill on. It basically can run on any machine tool. So I've had incredible luck, you know, with 200%, um, you know, depth of cuts, 10% step overs running on a one horsepower machine, you know, and it's just, it, it's phenomenal. It just, you know, produces those unique uh, volume L chips. Yeah, and again, that's that's kind of the thing that that we keep saying. It's it's good machining conditions are beneficial no matter what machine you're using them on. Uh, you get them set up, it's going to get the most out of your machining hardware that you have. Um, yeah, I could. I can remember a couple of years ago um, on a one horsepower Tormach making a video of volume mill, cutting it and sending it to Mike. And Mike was like, oh my gosh, you know, even on, you know, machines that are not very powerful, we're getting great results from volume mill. Well, and, and I, it, it, today's conversation confirmed a lot of stuff that John and I have talked about. You know, and I think the other thing too is, you know, John and John's also tested to the max of, you know, eBay carbide end mills on a Tormach running volume mill and getting crazy extended life out of an out of just a eBay end mill. You know, right. it, it's it's crazy impressive what it what it does, um, just outside of going fast. I I love hearing that. Um, that's that's that was the whole purpose of this, and and uh, so having that become reality is is music to my ears um but you know honestly we we hear it a lot uh, it's it's interesting you know when we first started taking this to machine shops back in you know 2008 9 whatever before people were so used to this as as they are now as i mentioned pretty much every system has something along these lines now but um you know uh, you take it out to the machine operator and 
you get a look of fear in his face. I'm not cutting this this fast. You, you can't cut this this fast. And then it starts and you know, the boss would tell them push cycle start and you hear that buzz and they got used to it very quickly. You know, but a lot of the pushback early on especially was, oh, this is only good if you have a really good machine. Oh, this is only good in hard materials. This isn't gonna help me in aluminum. You know, only this is only good if you have really expensive cutting tools. No, none of those things are true. None of this those things. Good. This is good no matter what you have. So this is uh, this has just been so informative, Glenn. Um, is there any possible way that we could get you back to maybe give us a similar overview of this, but to kind of flip it on its on its upside down here, and maybe go to looking at how it does on a lathe with volume turn. Uh, I would love to help you out in any way that I possibly can. I'm, Always uh, enjoy the opportunity to to talk about our products, and uh, yeah, we haven't talked about ball you turn at all, but um, uh, we're getting uh, results that are amazing with with that as well. Um, the uh, both from a machining standpoint and programming time standpoint, which is uh, you know obviously a, a subject for another time, but I would uh, love the opportunity to. Uh, to you know, speak with you again, and um, if this format works, I know you don't generally use the uh, the visuals here, but um, uh, with this subject matter, I think it's just kind of necessary. So, oh yeah, it was great. Your visuals were very good, and um, I just I'd really love to see it sometime here in the future where we could do this with uh, with Bayou Turn, get a good understanding of what's going on there. Yes, I would love the opportunity. Just let me know uh, when you'd like to do it and we'll make it happen. Yeah, that's, that sounds awesome. We'll, we'll definitely have to do that. Um, sorry for being quiet there towards the end. My mind was just th was just soaking in all your information there. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to uh, have you on again. And um, you can't thank you enough for taking time out today to uh, educate us on the world of high efficiency machining. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the... The pleasure is mine. I uh, appreciated the opportunity you gave me here, and um, yeah, would love to do this again. Yeah, and Glenn, thank you for making my machining experience so much better on a daily basis. <laughs> well, glad to hear that, and you are welcome. You've just listened to the 3D Experience with John and Mike. Subscribe to our podcast on SoundCloud and iTunes to catch up on upcoming episodes.